Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and we're very pleased to welcome you to our program, The Future of Cars, Electric, Autonomous, and Coming Your Way, Watch Out. And we're very pleased to welcome a panel tonight uh, from all different parts of the city uh, to discuss the provocative issues around our EVs and autonomous vehicle technology in the Bay Area and how these new modes of transportation will change our lives and the urban landscape. But for, before we begin, I'd like to find out how many of you are new to the Mechanics Institute? Who's never been here before? Any newcomers? Wonderful. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to invite you to come on Wednesday at noon and come for a free tour of the library um, and find out more about our history here in San Francisco. And also consider becoming a member. We have this really amazing library. We also have our events and programs, book clubs, writers groups, author events, cinema lit film series, and of course the chess room hosts an amazing array of classes and tournaments on a weekly basis. So we hope that you'll join and just become part of our ever-growing and really vital uh, cultural family here at the Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street. So I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight. who will then also introduce our panel. Um, John Villasenor is a senior, is a non-resident senior fellow of governance studies and the center for the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. He is also a professor of electrical engineering and public policy and a visiting professor of law at the University of California in Los Angeles. He is also a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Cybersecurity and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. His work addresses the intersection of technology, policy, and law. So please welcome John Villasenor. Oh, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for being here. I know that there's uh, many things you could be doing on a beautiful uh, November evening here, and you've chosen to spend a little bit of the evening with us, and so we're, we're thankful, and we'll try to, try to make it worth your while. Um, as all of you know, we're uh, in the middle of one of the most fascinating technology inflection points that we will probably see in, in any of our lifetimes, which is this incredible set of changes that, that are occurring uh, originally more in places like research laboratories, but more and more often on the streets and impacting our lives in, in transportation, and particularly uh, the advances that we're seeing with respect to electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles and some vehicles that are both electric and autonomous. And so we're going to uh, try to to demystify some of those changes and explain some of those changes and talk about what they mean, not only uh, from a technology standpoint, but this is one of these technology inflection points that promises to really fundamentally change in many ways sort of the, the urban and broader social landscape. And we'll try to address some of those, those things as well. Uh, with me, I have a, a terrific group of three panelists who bring a, a set of really great and diverse perspectives to this. I'll introduce <coughs> them in a moment. Before I do that, I was, want to give people a sense for the flow of the event. So I'll briefly uh, provide an introduction for each of the panelists. Uh, each of the panelists will then uh, speak for three or four minutes just to give his or her perspectives on, on some of these issues. I've then got a set of, of questions uh, relating to both electric and autonomous cars, uh, which will, uh, that'll take us through uh, roughly, uh, roughly 720 or so. Uh, and then we'll open it up to audience uh, Q&A. We intentionally structured this event to, to provide uh, ample opportunity for audience uh, questions and answers because I'm sure that you have some very interesting questions that, that the panel could provide some good perspectives on as well. So that's the, the flow of the event, and we'll wrap up uh, no later than uh, 7.50 uh, 7 p.m. So uh, just by way of introduction, immediately to my left, uh, to your right, is Lars Peters. He currently serves as the, as the Senior Zero Emission Vehicles Advisor for the city and county of San Francisco, and his responsibilities include developing a citywide transportation electrification strategy, expanding the availability of charging infrastructure, and developing policy and programs to support electrification. Uh, to his left, uh, to, on the right for you, is Maureen Blanc, who is the director of Charge Across Town, a nonprofit organization with the mission to help reduce carbon emissions 
from vehicles in California by promoting the adoption of zero emission vehicles. Charge Across Town educates the public about electrical, electric transportation and advocates for the adoption of electric vehicles and infrastructure in California. And then uh, last but certainly not least, all the way to my left and all the way to the right is Scott Nisbet, who is Vice President of Marketing uh, for Epilogue Imaging Systems. Uh, Scott has been working for over the last eight years in the auto industry in relation to technology to enhance driver safety and experience through connecting vehicles to a range of apps and services and making cars smart and connected to the Internet of Things. Uh, last year, he helped found the Autonomous Vehicle Camera Division of Epilogue, which is offering new vision technology that dramatically improves resolution and object recognition for self-driving cars. So it's a, a terrific uh, set of panelists. And so I'll start again uh, immediately to my left and hear some perspectives from uh, Lars. Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. So looking at it from a, from a city perspective, I think it's good to pry apart some of these transitions that increasingly are, are coming together. Um, I think often when you go to panels like this, I think there's, there's, there's three different trends uh, that disrupt the transportation industry overall. One is often called connectivity, so that's you know the internet and the way that that connects vehicles. That has given us you know our bike sharing program. It has given us uh, the ride sharing, uh, uh, Lyft and Uber uh, that we see increasingly in our city, um, and has enabled car sharing right in a way that wasn't previously uh, possible. So that's uh, by now almost uh, old, familiar technology for many people, but that's still kind of playing out there, out there in, the, in the city and we're, uh, you know, there's a lot of policy challenges and things we need to work on and grapple with uh, to, to address and, and make the best use of those technologies, make them for, uh, work for us and work for everyone. Uh, the second one, which is the closest uh, to me personally, what I work on day to day is the electrification part. Um, now that doesn't per se change how you go around but it, it does do most for our, uh, uh, for climate and for um, our urban quality and air quality. Um, now, like everybody here has seen that we don't, transportation is the only thing that affects our air quality in the city, many other sources, but uh, during a year, it's overwhelmingly the biggest impact. And uh, electrification, for the first time in a very long time, uh, provides us a pathway to completely eliminate those local emissions as well, mostly eliminate them uh, through the entire chain of transportation. Now lastly, autonomous vehicles, I think there, there we are, it's early days. Um, as a city, I think we're blessed with having a lot of innovators and a lot of people working out what, what can happen, what it means, uh, and, and launching some of those technologies right here. So we're uh, again, at the forefront of this as well. Um, from a city's perspective, right, we, we need to figure out, okay, how, how do we foster that? Um, and at what point in time uh, do we want to develop policies around uh, making the best use of this kind of technology? But that currently, uh, all this unknown, and that puts us policymakers always in a little bit of a perspective. Thank you very much. Maureen. Great. Well, <clears throat> good evening, everyone. How many of you own a car? How many of you own an electric car? One, two, somebody back there? Wow, okay. I've got some convincing to do in this room. So I'm the director of Charge Across Town. We were founded six years ago, actually, as a project for the city of San Francisco to help get San Francisco EV ready. And our goal at the time was to work with businesses and the development community to put in electric vehicle charging. And we came across a really interesting uh, problem. The developers said, well, why should we put in charging when no one is driving the cars? So we pivoted and really focused on consumer education. And for the past six years, we've been working in San Francisco. We're the folks that bring you EV Week every year down on the Embarcadero which is a free event to test drive electric cars. And today we work across the state of California. Our goal is to get people out of combustion engine or ICE cars and convert people over to cleaner, greener forms of transportation. So in the past six years, it's been a crazy ride. Um, I believe and we believe 
that California is on the threshold uh, of a major change in mass adoption of electric vehicles. And I say this in just all the work that we do across the state in talking to consumers. So to put that in perspective, um, there are only 700,000 electric cars sold in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's a drop in the bucket considering how many millions and millions of cars are sold every year. The good news is half of those are here in California, and uh, 62,000 of them are sitting right here in San Francisco. So we are, the Bay Area is the EV capital of the country, and uh, with the city of San Francisco and the mayor and many of the uh, programs and initiatives that hopefully you'll hear from tonight, we will continue to do so. However, there's some key challenges that remain, which we hopefully will get into. But being only 5% of car sales, um, we have a long way to go. And as many of you may know, our governor, uh, Jerry Brown, has a zero emissions vehicle mandate to have 1.5 million cars, electric cars, on the road by 2025. So we're climbing that curve. Uh, we think we are coming up, and we are very close to seeing massive market adoption. And we'll talk a little <laughs> bit more about that. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. Um, I'm Scott Nesbitt, um, working now with uh, Epilogue, which I'm fortunate enough to be seeing the autonomous vehicle industry from the inside because we're offering a, um, a vision system for autonomous vehicles so they can see further and better um, than they can now with the current vision systems and LiDAR systems. So we're trying to make these cars much safer so that everyone can feel comfortable getting an autonomous car. And that is going to happen a lot sooner than you think. As John alluded to, we're at a we're at the cusp of a fundamental change in our, how our urban environment is going to look because in a matter of years, you'll be able to walk outside and hail a car that has no driver in it. And that's going to happen. And it's hard to believe, um, but another debate took place. And I know we're going to debate whether when it's going to happen because I think it will be happening in three years. Uh, other people um, think it'll happen 15, 20 years but there's some fundamental differences um, to a normal change in technology, like electric vehicles. We just saw in this room one or two people have an electric vehicle, and Maureen was saying, you know, only a few hundred thousand here in the state of California. So that's a slow change. This autonomous vehicles is going to be a, a quick, much quicker change. There is a massive amount of technology. More importantly, the companies that are doing it are not just regular startups. These are billion dollar companies that are throwing their might in technology at this. And much more likely and more effective is they're throwing a lot of money at the lobbying so that the rules change, so that cities are perhaps guided, and I don't want to say forced, to change rules to allow these autonomous vehicles to come in. And you can look at it. It's, it's, you know, we're sitting here, all the streets lined with parked cars just sitting there all day, not moving. You're, you're probably getting here. You were, may have almost been hit by a car, <laughs> driven by a distracted driver. Um, you, you just turn over your life to these things that are just roaming the streets. And when autonomous vehicles come, you're going to be able to get some of that um, freedom back to walk safely on the streets. And if you think about this institution here, about probably 105 years ago, Probably somewhere in those books, there's a record of a panel talking about, oh, no, these things, cars, they're, they're never, never going to work. These horses are great. They'll never, you know, they don't kill as many people. These cars are dangerous. And probably right here in this, in this building, there was a debate s s saying, oh, cars will never catch on. What's wrong with a horse? But it did happen, and it seems so obvious that it would happen. But, uh, but it wasn't obvious in that day. And the same thing is happening now. People are not selling their stock in buggy, buggy whip companies now. Um, the equivalent is, you know, the, this is changing. Uber drivers may be out of, and, and uh, rideshare drivers may be out of business uh, in terms of the amount of work they get, but their new jobs are created from this. Um, and it's, it's going to shift. And there are, and we shouldn't look at the current rideshare companies either. There are technologies and other companies that are going to embrace this that help um, drivers of today um, own perhaps a, a um, autonomous driving um, rideshare company. So anyway, this is it's an exciting time, and you will fundamentally change five years from now. I will predict that each of you, most of you, will be in, you will have taken one ride in an autonomous vehicle in the next five years. 
Okay, well, this is a, a great sort of initial set of perspectives, and so I'm gonna, we're going to bifurcate the discussion a little bit, and we're gonna, our first question, we're going sp to speak about electric vehicles, which, of course, some electric vehicles are autonomous, but, but some are not. Um, and just in terms of electric vehicles, will we reach a point where <coughs> most of the vehicles that we see, when we walk out of a building like this, and you look, look, look down the street and you see the cars uh, driving down the street and parked along the street, Will we reach a point where most of those vehicles uh, here in San Francisco are indeed electric vehicles? And if so, when? Uh, and uh, what are the challenges that we need to address to get to that point? And these are questions, of course, for anyone on the panel. And uh, any thoughts, more than welcome. Sure. Well, I can take a stab at it since I sort of do this for a living. Um, we deal with consumers, so I can give you the consumer perspective. Um, we have been, as I said, working across the state of California we survey people before and after they test drive a car. So most people come to our educational events having never even been in an electric car. They have sort of a general idea of what they are, and we let them get behind the wheel and take them out for a spin. When they come back, we survey them again to see what kind of changes in attitudes. Um, and what we see are people genuinely love these cars. Uh, they love the experience. They, we ask them what they like the most about it. Um, and it's always surprising because the quiet ride always comes up as the number one reason uh, people like electric cars. But basically, um, people want more and more choice. So when we started six years ago, there were three cars on the market. Today we have 41 different electric cars. You can basically uh, purchase a car for under $20,000, get a leased uh, used electric vehicle, state-of-the-art, um, four years old. Um, so I don't think they're, it's a matter of not do they want them, but when we will see ubiquity across um, the landscape. There's also tremendous rebate programs pushing consumers towards adopting electric cars. You've got uh, cities and uh, regionalities across the state of California offering up to $10,000 off the price of cars if you go electric. So with all of this policy and uh, choice coming, we truly do think that it's going to happen sooner than, than later. Any other perspectives on that? I think my answer is yes. Uh, yeah, the question was when. Oh, well, that was the second part of the question, <laughs> obviously. Um, and, and we must, and, and we must do it um, as soon as we can. And, and, and I guess that gets to the when uh, and, and why not sooner. Um, so... Yeah, we need to do it because transportation emissions are over 40% of our emissions in the city. So to meet our climate action goals, we need to do it as a city because our air quality is actually worsening uh, instead of getting better as it used to over the years. Um, uh, we need to do it also at the same time reducing the total number of cars. We everything, making everything electric will, will not do anything uh, for congestion uh, or safety. Uh, per se. Um, so to me, I think the uh, part of the chicken egg problem, right, the cars uh, is, is solved or will be solved really soon. Right? There, there will be cheaper, uh, better on, on pretty much all aspects and there will be as much variety um, as, as one could, could look for uh, in the very near future, so now I'm talking about within 10, 10 years, those models will be there. And then the challenges will be, uh, you know, can we make them available to everybody? Uh, specifically, how can you get everybody to, to charge those cars? And that's not easy here. Uh, but, you know, about a third of our cars are, are uh, housed on the street overnight. Um, another, a little over a third, is, are in shared forms or in garages. And those are, those are big challenges, and that's where uh, the city has a role, and, and uh, together partnering with organizations um, as well as, as uh, you know, landlords and, and people that, that can help do this. Great. Thank you. Any but I think that's, that's good that it's the old model, though, because I do think that the autonomous vehicles, and I do think the majority of autonomous vehicles will be electric, um, and that will probably be the biggest category of new electric vehicles being um, utilized is autonomous vehicles. But when you have autonomous vehicles as a majority of, of cars on the street, the fundamental questions come on of, well, why would you own one? Why wouldn't you just have rideshare or shared use cars? 
And these are, that's going to change the um, environment. Parked cars possibly could not be out there anymore. You could actually have ownership of the streets again. The cars would be moving, autonomous vehicles. This is one vision of the future, that there are no parked cars, there are no parking garages. These cars are just coming to move you. Mobility as a service. Um, and everyone is enriched by this because you can get from A to B. Why do you need to spend the large resources to buy a gas car or electric car when you can just utilize them? And this is what's going to change. And one vision is that it will completely change the environment uh, out there, and there won't be this massive reliance on parking spaces and stuff. And so a city, on uh, San Francisco, I, I, of all the cities around there, they're going to be leading the way, I think, uh, when they see this change is actually happening. And I'm, my opinion is it's going to happen sooner than, mm -hmm. than we think. Uh, I'm, yeah, please. I just want to add a comment on infrastructure, because one of the big hurdles that we see and we hear constantly is there are not enough charging stations. And, um, and I know you guys are dealing tremendously with um, charging stations in San Francisco, which is, has its unique problem because many of us live in apartments where there's no access to electricity. But I think the consensus from what we're hearing and what we're seeing is that infrastructure is going to be solved in the next three years. There's a tremendous amount of money being dumped in to California and to cities right now to put in charging stations. And you guys might be aware that PG&E is going to deploy 5,000 uh, charging stations here and in Northern California. 20% of them are going to go into apartment buildings. 15% are going to go into disadvantaged uh, communities. But the biggest gain is going to come from the Volkswagen investment plan and the settlement, which you might have heard about. And they're mm -hmm. dumping $800 million into EV infrastructure across highways and uh, small cities, streets, et cetera. So charging, whether it's electric cars or autonomous vehicles, is going to get addressed pretty quickly in the next five years. I remember reading something, yeah. but I, th I may be wrong, but I believe it was written by one of the founders of Lyft who pointed out that uh, your car, even though you think of it as a driving machine, is more aptly described as a parking machine. Yes. Um, because that's really what it does most of the time. It's par parked. That's mm -hmm. what it does. Um, okay, so uh, move on to another question about um, what are sometimes called TNCs, and for those in the business, this is an acronym for transportation network companies, and uh, more commonly known as companies such as uh, Uber or Lyft. Uh, and uh, many people suggest, not without reason, that there's a connection uh, between TNCs and their broader impacts, which we've all seen on, uh, on cities, and the growth in both autonomous and slash or electric vehicles. So what impacts do you see from the TNCs on the autonomous and or electric landscape? And vice versa, what impact do you see the changes in vehicle technology and adoption having on uh, the transportation network companies such mm -hmm. as Uber and Lyft? And of course, then on our experience in engaging with those companies. Any thoughts on that? Um, I know you guys you want, me, you want me to go first on this? Um, yeah, so... I think the, the impacts are, are out there for, for everybody to see. Uh, there is, in terms of electrification, um, there is a growing number of electric uh, TNC uh, cars out there. Uh, a company named Maven, owned by GM, is, is, is very active in that field. Uh, I think you see the, the Chevy Bolts uh, out there, but you also have already for years folks that, that drive uh, Nissan Leafs, et cetera. There's, there's been a number of pilots, of course, other cities in the U.S. as well as in Europe uh, that indicate that the, uh, the problem so far is that the more affordable cars uh, used to have a very limited battery capacity. And for these kind of use cases, it makes a world of a difference if you have 200 plus miles of range or, as the older cars used to have, under 100 miles. And, and um, I think the, the signs are very hopeful that there now are the vehicles, they're still slightly expensive, but there now are the vehicles that, that would um, serve a TNC driver for the full day and, and can do his entire shift, maybe during a lunch break, hit a, hit a fast charger, and we need more of those, right? We don't have enough of them. And um, um, so my perspective is uh, that we have some catching up to do there. Um, but these fleets are professional drivers. They're, you know, coin operated, if you like. They look carefully at the economic incentives, and electric cars can be cheaper in that situation. So I think there's a, we'll see a quick change. 
I, ag <clears throat> I agree, and I would even push a little bit further and say that <clears throat> Lyft and Uber are a problem, and they need uh, to get in this conversation and be at the table. Whenever I get in a Lyft or an Uber, which is rarely, mm -hmm. I always ask the driver, you know, how far do you go on your shift? And they tell me, oh, anywhere from 100 miles or less. How many hours are you driving? Oh, two to four. And it's like, why aren't you driving an electric car? And part of it is just educating drivers that these cars are viable platforms for them to do their job. Um, and they can you know, get out of a fossil fuel vehicle and really drive a Bolt or a Volt or even a BMW i3 you know, that go up to 100 plus miles uh, and not always have to drive a fossil fuel car. So when we go and talk to Lyft and Uber about this, <clears throat> it's sort of not their problem. And I think that uh, getting them into this conversation is really important. As you guys have probably read, every morning 5,600 cars flood into San Francisco, delivering people to work, and it's impacting our air quality, it's congestion. So I think it's a problem that's going to be dealt with. And I know I'm looking to my friend here because I know you guys are working on some solutions. But I think they definitely need to be a bigger part of this conversation. Any thoughts from you, Scott? I agree. Um, and I'll put the autonomous vehicle thing uh, uh, edge on it here in that these cars, I mean, we look at Uber and Lyft, they are investing heavily in autonomous vehicle research right now, along with other uh, stealth uh, startups that are throwing billions of dollars at this. And it will, 90% of them are going to be electric. And these are very important because not only when the shift comes from the driver is choosing which car, and they and it does make sense, as Maureen said, that they should choose an electric. Um, but those electric cars without drivers at some point will, e will be so efficient um, and will definitely help the pollution in our, in our cities here. And, um, and we, you know, there are the more uh, society problems of, okay, do, what's going to happen when there's no drivers to these cars? But that's another issue. But I think that the trend it, you know, we ride on the back that these that the electric vehicles will be slowly taking over the rideshare uh, percentage of cars out there, and then autonomous after that. Okay. So here's a broader question, uh, just about the impact of electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles. As uh, as we all know, although it's it's such it's such a profound influence that we don't even often think about it, but the car has just had an incredible influence on our society. And of course, the transition from horses to cars uh, a little over 100 years ago fundamentally reshaped uh, America, right? It, the car was the, a large reason behind the growth of suburbs and uh, the structure of our uh, urban and suburban uh, uh, and rural landscape. Uh, and in addition, of course, the car has had this fundamental sort of social uh, impact on, on conceptions of independence. It's had impacts in terms of work patterns and commuting patterns and literally the contours of, of the environment that we, we've all grown up in. And so I guess the question for the panel is, what are these, are we going to see changes as fundamental? If we fast forward, if we get past the, the transition window, and we can argue about how long, or disagree about how long that's going to take, but let's assume for the purposes of this question that we move to a world where most cars are electric, and many, if not most cars or vehicles are autonomous. How, what will that do? What do physically to the urban landscape, to our social uh, landscape, what, what impacts do you foresee? Number one, it will save lives. Um, right. You know, in this country, about 38,000 people die a year in car crashes. Here in San Francisco, um, I believe last year, 16 pedestrians lost their life. That's once you go autonomous, that's likely to go next to zero. So I'm sure there'll be people that throw themselves in front. Um, but that will we'll go near to zero. Uh, bicycle accidents, the, the roads can be you know, <coughs> shared much better with an autonomous vehicle than a distracted human uh, vehicle. And you're going to save lives, you're going to save money too, because now, and this is what's going to change more than just the look and feel, it's going to change the economy. Because what happens when you have cars not crashing each other is you don't have all those body shops, you don't have those car repair, electric vehicles are going to fundamentally change things because they take a lot less maintenance uh, even when they don't hit anything. And these are, these are trends that are happening now. The insurance uh, industry, the car insurance industry, puts a lot of money into our economy, and that is slowly going to change and fundamentally change. And we don't know what's going to happen um, economically and society-wise. But going back to your physical environment, I do think that the idea of there being less parking, um, less 
as uh, John was saying, less um, cars just sitting around all the time on the streets. Um, you, you can only imagine. I'm sure we've all been in Golden Gate Park on the Sundays when they don't allow cars, and you go, wow, this is so amazing. But that's how it was 105 years ago. <laughs> so, um, you know, we can return to that. And uh, that is one path. There is another view, though, which is like we're seeing, that Marie mentioned all these cars, uh, rideshare cars coming into the city, that it could increase traffic if everyone is getting a ride from here to there, hops in their autonomous car, all of a sudden is there, is there more cars, more traffic? Maybe fewer parked cars, but maybe more traffic. And that's why we need guidance from the city um, and other thought leaders to, to sort of structure the rules at the beginning here before, um, before the industry guys, before the big billion dollar companies you know, all of a sudden build us the equivalent of Embarcadero Freeway. And so, <laughs> Maureen, you've got something to say here. Sure, I think, I totally agree with Scott. I do think that our roads, our bridges, our highways are a mess. And I think, you know, let's talk about the gas tax. Um, we need to put some money into fixing California's uh, infrastructure. We've delayed maintenance on roads for decades. If we're going to have a transit revolution and introduce autonomous cars and really create dedicated lanes and really do this right, we have to invest in fixing our roads and our infrastructure. So um, I know that's going to be a huge discussion in the next election. Uh, is the gas tax, you know, a good thing or a bad thing? But someone's got to pay for it. And, you know, whether it's the private sector or the public sector, um, we, we do have, a, I think, a huge infrastructure issue that that's going to have to get dealt with. Any thoughts from you, Lars, on the... Yes, I... I I think uh, we're talking about like different orders of effects, right? There's the kind of what I would call first order of effect, mm -hmm. which is you, you get rid of the fatalities, you make the cars electric, you improve your air quality, etc. Then, then we get into second and third order effects, second order effects, well, now I don't need a parking garage anymore, why would I own a car if I go by myself, I get a small one, I share it with my neighbor or not, I, I go to the mountains, it's snowing, I got something that gets me there, etc. So, so that, you know, car ownership model, uh, I think can be, because these economics can be so attractive, can be shifted very, very quickly, especially also because of the cost of a parking garage or parking space in our city is very, very high. So you may even see this happen much faster here than, than, in, than in other places. Um, the third order effects are, are um, hard to predict, and then I'm thinking about how so far what better and cheaper transportation has done often is incentivized or made it possible for people to live further and further away from the city and commute further and further. And that gets into, um, some folks call this kind of the heaven or hell scenario, right? Like you can use this technology to get this clean city with very few cars, or you can get people that come from very far away sleep in the morning in their very Sleep luxurious the bed cars yes. and the bed let cars, the car right. drive around the block all day to avoid having to pay for parking and then go back home. Yeah. So, um, no, I don't think we'll, I don't think there <laughs> don't will be policy so sure. if, that, if it trends to that, that <laughs> direction. But there's, of course, the, the reality will be somewhere in the middle. Um, and, and we need to think and collaborate even more closely here in the B greater Bay Area. I think this is not something that we can control by the city as well. There's a lot of cars coming into the city, city every day, as well as our residents take our cars to other places, right? And sometimes they can't get to those places if, by any other by any other way. Um, there's also new opportunities for 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 transit, like you know, there's, there's parts of the city. Uh, so, for instance, when I got here, I got here by BART. Now, how do I get to the BART station? Well, to make it in time. Um, I, I took a TNC to get to get to that station. I think that's that's an interesting option. It's better than driving all the way, mm -hmm. right? So so think about those kind of things, especially if that TNC would have been cheaper um, to get me there because it's autonomous, or it could have even more effectively shared something. We're seeing the start of some of that really good, really good kind of options that are out there. Um, it's early days, I think, on the on the autonomous vehicle technology to ask for kind of a firm policy. Um, just a little thinking, I think the, uh, I would applaud the private sector so far for very actively reaching out. There's a lot of reach out uh, from big and small companies, some in their infancy, some, some you know, very, very large to, to work with us. Let me ask a, a quick follow-up question. You know, the, the, the 
some of the answers about how things will be reshaped, because we're in a dense urban core, we tend to think of what will happen in a dense urban core. But of course, most Americans and most people don't live, you know, in dense urban cores. And so, would it? Would you agree or disagree with the, the suggestion that the 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 reshaping would be less dramatic in a suburb where garage space is cheap and it's not as easy to share with your neighbors because the economics don't make as much sense because I'm going 20 miles this way and my neighbor's going 15 miles that way. Is that a... That's one pathway is that, like the sleeper car, you know, now this is the danger perhaps of autonomous vehicles is now instead of the bedroom communities an hour and a half out in, you know, eastern, um, you know, Stockton, maybe now someone's commuting from uh, Lake Tahoe um, because they can sleep three hours along the way. Um, and that's a danger that is one view that could happen. And I think that with good guidance from government um, entities, that can be avoided, um, but we, we have to be careful. What's going to matter is, what's going to drive this is savings. And, and I want to just go back to that, you know, uh, entities like Charge Across Town are so wonderful because just like she spoke to the driver when we did, um, like, why, why don't you have an electric car? It makes sense because people don't see what things cost. And it took a long time for the car to catch on originally because people didn't see the value of a car until, you know, it was cheaper to, to own one than get yourself around uh, renting horses or buying a horse. And the same thing's going to happen here. You're going to see that it's going to be less expensive to either do ride share or um, with an autonomous car or, or not. And you, if you look at the true cost of it, black and white now, as Maureen would say, between owning an electric vehicle and owning a, a big gas car. Uh, because with less maintenance and uh, the cost per mile, um, it's maybe yet only one person in the room here has one. Right. The, so. the other perspective I'll add, which is, um, of course, more, more cars, all else being equal, will be more traffic. But one possible way to mitigate that is uh, there are these technologies, which some of you may have heard of, called vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, where, where intelligent vehicles can collaborate. And so instead of having you know, thousands of vehicles all optimizing their own individual paths to the city, if there could be some global coordination, that's an opportunity to smooth uh, or reduce some of the, the congestion issues, although certainly not eliminate them. And I certainly would share the concern that was expressed that, of course, if you have thousands more cars, generally speaking, you're going to have more congestion. So I'll just ask another quick question or two, and then we'll move to uh, some audience questions. Uh, what are some of the latest uh, technology trends uh, that you're seeing that might impact either from the either from the, the traditional big automakers or the startups that might impact this this accelerated move or help accelerate the move into either electric vehicles or autonomous vehicles? Any are there anything anything that we wouldn't have already read about and anything less obvious that you're seeing that that you can tell the audience about here? So. I, 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 I see, I, we have meetings with a, large, a, lot, a, a, um, a number of the large automakers and uh, the startups that are well-funded, and there's a few that are worth, on paper, a few billion dollars because they have this vision of the future of autonomous cars. And it is very divergent, their views, not only technologically, some want cameras and LiDAR on the roof, some want it hidden so no one can see it, you know, it'll ruin the design of their car. I want to explain what LiDAR is. Oh, right? um, it's using lasers to see as opposed to uh, camera technology, and that can help you see in the dark and, and better. And it's, it's a technology that uh, a lot of money is going into, and you'll see, when you see the self-driving cars, uh, practicing around San Francisco, you'll see the dome on the top, and that's a LiDAR system. And that's just lasers coming out and seeing the landscape. It's one way, another way to have redundant safety measures so they don't hit anything. Um, but you, you, the technologically, these, these things are coming, a lot of money is going into it, but they all are very different. It's maybe like the beginning of cars. Some people thought it was gonna be steam power versus gas power. Um, and they didn't know quite how, what the final uh, form factor was going to be, and that's what's happening now. But unlike the beginning of cars, these are billion dollar companies uh, throwing money at these systems that are com sometimes completely different vision. And they also have different views of what the ownership, of what, how they're gonna sell cars. Some of them think they're just gonna sell, people are gonna have an autonomous car in their garage, okay? That, so it's very similar to today's ownership where you pay your $50,000 for an autonomous car and you sit in and drive. But other people think that no one's going to own a car. It's all going to be shared use either through rideshare companies or you're going to be in a group of 20 people that own a car and then share it. And uh, 
that's another way. Or entities, governments will own cars and shuffle autonomous cars and shuffle people around. So the automakers, as you look at them, and I, I have to be uh, uh, general, uh, generalize this. I can't say the uh, particulars, but some of them just really feel that no one is going to own a car. It's going to be shared. And that is a, a fundamental shift of, of what is happening. Other ones don't expect anyone to own anything or get into anything. They just want uh, to go from point A to B. And these are uh, amazing times. You, you will not recognize the streets in 10 years. That's Any other thoughts on technologies over the horizon that you would? Sure, I think battery technology, which you guys probably have read about, is just accelerating faster and faster. So I tell everybody, don't <clears throat> buy a car, lease a car, because in two years, you're going to get twice the range, uh, turn it in and, and you know get another model and go faster. But what we're seeing and what we're hearing from the car manufacturers uh, are leaps and bounds in battery technology. Uh, I started in the personal computer industry in the 80s, and it reminds me on like steroids how PCs just went from, you know, luggables to uh, portables to laptops. This is going to happen, you know, in a nanosecond, and you're going to see cars really going hundreds and hundreds of miles. And that's a charge. huge, and that's a huge factor for adoption, yeah. right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. And computer power is the yeah. other thing in there, the yeah. battery power. And so. at the LA Auto Show, which is going on right now, um, you know, every major car company is introducing electric. It's it's called the Electric LA Auto Show. And uh, Jaguar just announced a car today. I mean, every, everybody's in the game. So it's moving really fast. And I think um, from a consumer point of view, it's sort of like, oh, my God, um, you know, which car, you know, should I go electric, fuel cell, uh, all battery, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of education as a consumer that you need to do in order to really step up and figure out what you want. So we'll move in a, in a moment to audience questions. I'll just close out this portion by reemphasizing the safety issue, which was brought up before. I, you know, I like to, to tell people, sometimes you, you, re, you read about you know, the, the terrible things that happened hundreds of years ago where the mortality rates for certain things were far higher than they were today, and you wonder, how in the world did people put up with that? And I think 100 years from now, people are going to look back and, and th say, how did we think it was normal that 100 people every day in this country were going to die in motor vehicle fatalities. How did we, how did we accept that as normal, which we have, ten, we have all come to do? But, mm -hmm. but it's, it is largely preventable. Uh, and we have the technology that can knock that number down, uh, if not to zero, uh, a lot closer to zero than we are today. So I think that's, that's one of the, and of course, not only do we have 100 fatalities about every day, but we have hundreds more uh, injuries that occur every day uh, on the roads. Most of those fatalities and injuries ascribable directly to driver error. Uh, or to uh, to uh, you know, terrible lapses in judgment like you know driving uh, drunk and, and so on and committing errors because people are drunk. So that's a, that's a you know putting aside even the convenience factors and the environmental factors, all of which are important. There's just there's this this incredible toll that we've come to uh, accept as normal, which which we shouldn't accept as normal, and we we don't have to accept as normal. So uh, let, let me move now to some audience questions. Um, we have a roving mic ah, somewhere here. And so I'll just, uh, I'll try to get to people. I would ask uh, that you uh, uh, try to get to the question uh, sooner rather than later so we can hear from our panelists. And I guess we had a gentleman right here in the front, and, uh, and then we'll kind of move around. Yes, sir. Fascinating, to say the least. My question is for Mr. Scott, but anyone can answer. So, so far, I'm envisioning Uber drivers out of a job, parking <laughs> attendants out of a job, <laughs> garage attendants and uh, uh, repair truck, truck people, drivers too. Right? Truck drivers, yeah. possibly Muni. Uh, are we solving one problem and creating another <clears throat> one by having all of those unemployed people? Who's going to pay for their support? That's Thank you. one way to look at it. But uh, five years ago, or you know, or so there were. No Uber drivers, no Lyft drivers, no, there was just taxi drivers. So those are new jobs. They are going to change fundamentally, but we don't know what jobs are going to be created by this, what opportunities are going to be created. Looking on the optimistic side, the, the, the world is going to be completely different. And just like when the horses were gone, the, no more buggy whip you know, makers, no more manure picker uppers, yes, they lost their job, but unknown jobs were created. 
fixing cars that were wrecking, you know, those mechanic jobs, those were just created. And so we, we will have new jobs created. And yes, there will be transition uh, from that. And certainly the big, big companies, the uh, rideshare companies are investing billions to go to autonomous vehicles. They make no secret of it. So. Any other thoughts on the employment question? I will speak on behalf of Lars, because you may not know this data point, but the mayor's office is actually um, has recognized and is working with City College to teach um, college students how to repair autonomous and electric cars. So, you know, a lot of these kids go through and study a trade. They go out into auto repair, and there's a program at City College to really start to shift these jobs over. So it's going to take efforts like that to really mm -hmm. create the new jobs, but your point is an excellent one. Yeah. And I think taking, you know, leaders like our mayor and, you know, other cities to really focus in on, okay, who are the folks being impacted and how do we retrain them into a new market? Uh, I was just wondering, um, why isn't any of the industry or any of the folks that are engaged in this transition not being more engaged in some of the policy and infrastructure decisions that are being made today that we won't even see, like, you know, manifested for another 10 years or so? And I'm talking about things like the most recent proposal by um, San Mateo City and County Association of Governments to widen uh, the 101. There, there's an environmental impact right now where they're planning on spending $550 million or half a billion dollars on widening the freeway for more cars. And to me, $550 million is a lot of infrastructure yep. for EVs. It's a lot of transit. It's a lot of, a lot of other things that we need as opposed to spending it on something that by the time it's implemented is going to be obsolete. Correct. And I, if I may, I agree that the industry industry should do a better job of lobbying. They have all these billions to lobby. That should be one of them saying you don't need to spend this money. It's just momentum of, of the highway making lobby uh, going ahead and spending more money. They have gas money that has to be, or gas tax money that has to be spent on highway improvement. There's just this momentum of bureaucracy that's keeping it going. At least that's my opinion of it. And once again, back to autonomous cars, you don't need wider lanes. In fact, you can have, you know, it'll be very Com compact transportation on the freeways of the future, so. If I, if I may generalize a little bit and shoot myself in the foot uh, in the process, it's, um, it's not just that, right? Like we are building entire new neighborhoods and those neighborhoods are built with parking. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's a very brave developer and person that would kind of bet and be as visionary to say, oh, we don't need that and still be able to, to sell the units and make the product, uh, the project work. So this is, I think, uh, part growing pains, part existing momentum, part, you know, uh, existing regulations. I think we're moving away from, uh, in our city at least, and I know other cities are, are hopefully, are considering from, from parking minimums to parking maximums, right? We're, we're in many aspects here in San Francisco leading the country in, in I think our newer developments are around 0.8 or 0.85. You could still see like if, if what folks are saying here comes through, especially if that happens quickly, a lot of that will be uh, space for other uses, <laughs> to, to put it that way. So we'll make some mistakes. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very hard way to foresee the future and change everything we've done in the past. There's a tendency to keep things going as they go. Like, colleague from um, uh, or yesterday said that he, you know, we, we, we take, try to take safe decisions in some they are not always sane decisions in his mind. Um, you know, I, it, it's good to have that possible future in there. So if we build a parking lot then let's say we can foresee that potentially it could be used for something else, you can build that in. We're doing that in a sense that we're for electric vehicles where I think the pathway is clearer and, and more near term in my mind, and more predictable perhaps, uh, we already mandate as of actually January 1st this year for all new parking. If you build parking, you have to ensure that it can be electrified or is electrified from the start. Electrified as in that there's a point to charge an electric vehicle. I guess one I'll just add um, uh, th that I think 
a lot of the big automakers are engaged in the policy uh, discussion. And it's a, the policy discussion is a very complex landscape because, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, vehicles in general are regulated across multiple levels. Right? To give one complex example, um, as you probably know, it's federal law that mandates that cars have to have seat belts physically in the car. Yet it's state law, which is where you decide, you know, you know, do you have to wear the seat belt and on what circumstances can you be cited? Uh, and so then there's also uh, stuff at the county level and then, and then, of course, at the municipality level. So uh, with uh, autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles, the, the entire regulatory sort of, you know, stack, right, gets impacted. So it's a, it's a very complex landscape. And um, from the stuff I do uh, in Washington, D.C., I certainly see a lot of engagement on the regulatory uh, front, uh, but it's a complex landscape. There's, there's, you know, there's the safety regulations. There's the liability questions that come up. It's a, it's a really complex landscape. So, okay. we've got two questions here. Then we'll hop over there and come back. Okay. So, so I just wanted to know how you uh, proposed in increasing the uh, maximum electric range in the maximum range in all electric vehicles, and uh, whether you're going to focus on like. Um, maybe uh, like direct battery swaps after, I'm talking about driving from like here to LA or from here to, you know, New York or whatever, is increasing the maximum range so I'm not worried about 268 miles as such per, per vehicle. I, would, I, would, I, can, I can go with that. There's actually, um, so the car, the industry kind of develops and, and meets customer demand for those longer ranges, right? And, and battery technology, as Maureen suggested, is playing a large part, like for the same number of pounds or space for a battery, uh, I, I think the numbers are 50% more power already over the last five years or so. That, that's a curve that's, that's just uh, continues to amaze me how, how quickly that's progressing. That increases everything. Um, also efficiency, by the way. And now, how to get to LA and back, or how to, let's say, drive like a New York cab driver, right? Like 70,000 miles a year or something in an electric car. Um, the charging technology, we haven't discussed that as much yet. There is uh, the speeds that are common today. There are technologies out there, new standards, uh, widely supported across the industry. Uh, that go seven and up to 10x those speeds. So instead of having to wait for an hour, uh, now you reduce that to, let's say, six minutes. Now, the charging technology is expensive. There's not enough of it. We're working with various private sector investors and partners, uh, some of them that were mentioned here earlier, uh, to get that also deployed here in the city. So we'll see that soon. Um, uh, but then the cars need to follow. They need to be able to accept that, uh, that, that it's more common for buses and so forth to accept that kind of power. So a lot of exciting stuff there, and it will be, make it a lot easier, specifically if you don't have a charger at home or you drive a lot or long distance. We're hearing from Tesla drivers that there's lines now at supercharging stations. Uh, if you go from here to L.A. and you pull in to the Tesla supercharging station, there's two or three cars in line. So as the adoption ticks up, the, um, you know, especially highway charging is definitely going to have to be shorter, faster, and be able to take a six-minute charge and not sit there for 20 minutes. So. Hi. Um, I apologize if this issue has already been discussed, but I was late because I took public transit in the wheelchair <laughs> ramp was broken mm. where I needed to get off. And Uber and Lyft are not an option for me. Uh, and my question is partly policy and partly technology for either electric vehicles or autonomous vehicles. Is your technology compatible with my technology? And uh, the irony is I'm in an electric vehicle right this very minute. <laughs> right. And, uh, People with disabilities and seniors who don't drive, they would be highly motivated early adopters. Absolutely. And speaking for myself, I worked in software for 28 years, but I see myself being uh, shut out of a lot of these new transportation technologies before they're even started. So I, policy and technology, I'd like to hear about your designs. Thank you. Um, the autonomous vehicle industry groups are looking at that. Um, obviously, it's, 
it depends on what sort of help you need. There's certainly technologically designs are there to uh, allow access, but there will always be uh, the possibility of having a person in the autonomous vehicle who's ready to help um, anyone who needs help in there. That would be a special service that would uh, be out there and available, and that's what's being talked about. But not now. Special service. Oh, that's not the word. Yeah. Then I do. I do think that technologically there are possibilities, and it's it's we need we need opinions, we need advice um, as as that, and that they are being more open than they have been in the past as far as new technologies. So I would encourage you to to reach out um, and other people to to the autonomous vehicle associations that are forming now. There are there are still too many of them to uh, to you know no one is one voice yet. So. There's also, um, you know, a lot of this falls under CARB in Sacramento. There's an organization called Veloz, V-E-L-O-Z dot org, and all the major car manufacturers are members. They need to hear from you. Um, when we started six years ago, we got calls from the ADA and like-minded organizations wanting to know about sound issues, about access issues, about if you're in a wheelchair and you have a car and you want to charge it, are there wheelchair charging stations? So. It's all been discussed, but I don't think anybody's acted on it. So you're absolutely right, and I, again, agree with Scott that you guys need to be at the table and helping create some of this so that you get what you need out of this. There, there are some initiatives on the way, policy to amend the situation, uh, in part, I don't know for you personally, but, 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 but generally to, to, to uh, create more universal access options. One is that there is now, for the state of California, as of January this year already, a description of what it means to have an accessible charging station uh, for an electric car. So some description on how to reach it, how to move around the vehicle, and so forth. So a special description of what those mandates are that, that didn't exist before and doesn't exist in most parts of the US. So that's for kind of public mm -hmm. charging infrastructure we would see that automatically now being implemented. Now, most of what is out there right now uh, was not built according to those specifications. You're, you'll see various, you know, enablements in the, in the real world right now. With the future, or we should, we should see uh, better that. And on the vehicle side, I think this is where uh, that lack of variety that we used to have, right? This, this idea like there's, you know, the electric car was kind of the smaller one, kind of a sedan, et cetera were not, no, there was no electric minivan or something. It's slow, I would say, but you're starting to see Chrysler now has a version of the Pacifica that's a plug-in uh, hybrid electric um, that can be accommodated uh, for, for wheelchairs, which is a step in that direction. And we, we have our hope that therefore we can also electrify some of the, uh, the accessible transit options that are, that are there. Perhaps you remember this, but a year ago, November 2016, Muni was hacked. What assurance do we have about autonomous vehicles not getting hacked? Yeah, yeah, I, think As. I, I think anyone who offers assurance about cybersecurity is always proven wrong sooner or later. So I think, uh, um, but I, I guess I would, I, would, I, would, I would broaden the question and point out that Regular, or I don't know if they're regular, but non-electric, non-autonomous vehicles these days are highly connected, and therefore, with the many advantages that happens, have risks as well. So I think the cybersecurity issue is one that that is uh, pervasive across the entire uh, vehicle industry, including, of course, in uh, autonomous vehicles. I don't have a solution. And Maybe right. And many, many of you likely travel an autonomous vehicle right now in, in an airplane. Uh, it. it has a large percentage of its life is uh, autonomous and not controlled by humans. And there are not too many headlines of, uh, of hacks there. Possible, of course, like John said, you can't guarantee it. Uh, but there are technologies and solutions that can make it. And if you just, in general, do the numbers, no matter what these, you know, there will be accidents with autonomous vehicles. But it's going to be far less than the 38,000 people who are killed every year in the United States and the, you know, 16 people that were killed I, last year. I, I guess I'll just add to that, but I think the question is a really important one because it's not just security, it's also privacy. So, yeah. for example, to the extent that these, these vehicles are collecting data 
uh, and that data could potentially be exposed. And the data may not necessarily only be physically in the car, it may be in the cloud, um, which creates another potential exposure vector. You know, history demonstrates that uh, people don't get this right the first time, right? In the sense that there will, you know, you'd, you'd be crazy to predict with certainty that there will never be any hacking incidents, you know, relating to autonomous or electric vehicles. That, that will be proven wrong, you know, maybe by next week, as far as we know. <laughs> um, so the, the, the be, and, and also I'm personally skeptical. Some people sometimes suggest that the government should somehow review all the software code and, you know, <laughs> hack proof it, but I'm not confident that, you know, that would be the right solution either. So, um, you know, I think there will be some bumps in that road, but, but even with those bumps, you know, to, to, to Scott's point, I think um, I, I would take a, uh, the, 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 the chance of a vulnerability uh, and that that could ex expose some safety issues, I would take that any day over the, the very real risk today of being hit by a drunk driver. Um, and so I think we're still better off going to the autonomous and electric route, but if there, there are going, certainly going, to, we're going to see news stories about hacks uh, Hopefully small ones, you know, not the nightmare one where somebody in a basement pushes a button and all the cars, brakes fail you know, all over the country. Let's hope that never happens. Right. So it, as far as I've been able to tell, all the autonomous vehicles that are being built right now are still equipped with steering wheels and gas pedals and all that sort of thing under the assumption that a human driver would have to perhaps take over in rare and unusual situations. And because of that, my understanding is that even if the car is um, very highly autonomous, the driver will still need to have a driver's license. As a person with a disability that's never been able to get a driver's license because of that, when do you think, um, the, when do you think that California's DMV will relent and allow people who don't have driver's license to use autonomous vehicles? Uh, <laughs> next year, uh, 2018. So in Arizona, there are autonomous cars driving on the street. You will be able to get in, my prediction, into a fully autonomous car um, service in 2020 here in San Francisco. So with no driver, no steering wheel, nothing except your trust that it's gonna get you from A to B. Thoughts on that? <laughs> so uh, conventional cars today are controlled by individual human beings, and um, there's not much you can do about how well they drive. You can have driver training and education and so on and hope that worked. Um, you can uh, stop the car and cite the driver. Um, with uh, autonomous cars, uh, the car is controlled by code that was developed by a developer at a workstation, uh, and it continues to be developed by them. Uh, that code might be open source, it might not. Um, uh, but uh, what are some of the um, uh, advantages of that? How do you see that changing, say, regulation of cars? Um, and how they behave and uh, how, whether they, um, you know, obey the law, let's say. Sounds like a question that's above my pay grade, but I, I'm <laughs> willing to attempt it anyway. So there, there is, I think to parse that a little bit, I think there's a, there's a legal question there around liability and so forth and who's responsible for this. Is this the, uh, the, the, the service that operates it, the, the license, like is it DMV, is it the, city that says this car could drive there, is this the OEM that produced the car, is there you know, all the manufactured components in there. Um, not very close to how that, that clearly feels as like an unresolved question that, that I, I think people are really actively uh, studying right now. I haven't heard of a great answer, but one of my co palinists have heard of, of a direction this is going, great to hear. Then there's a technical one um, on that as well, uh, which you alluded to, is around how, you know, should the code base be open so that it's, you know, um, can be inspected by everyone. And there, there are some initiatives on the way that, that do this. And, and then there's other initiatives that, uh, that guard everything in great secrecy. Um, so again, um, early days. And I see that yeah. talking to all the OEMs that some were very secretive, can't even say their name, and some of them were 
very happy to be on panels and make press releases and tell you almost everything they're doing. Um, and it just depends which one is going, you know, they're all going to move forward on this and uh, we'll see which resonates with the public most. I'll just add that the, the question about obeying the law, there's a whole, there's an incredibly fascinating session we could have, which isn't this session, on the ethics questions that mm. arise. And, you know, one example I sometimes see is if you're, if you have a, a road, one lane in each direction, and you're driving, and there's a big giant tree branch which has fallen and blocked one lane, but not the lane going in the opposite direction. You know, too big a branch to move. And you know, what, what we as people would do is we realize that we can't move the branch, and if no one else is coming, we'd go around it, right? But it wouldn't be very good if the autonomous car just stopped and waited two days until the road crew showed up, right? And then you can come up with all these ethical questions that, you know, for example, if you know you're driving someone to a hospital who's having a stroke, are you justified in driving five miles an hour over the speed limit? Most of us would say absolutely yes. Are you justified in driving 100 miles over the speed limit? Well, no. And so, how, how would an autonomous vehicle make and encounter those decisions? And there are these ethics questions about the trolley problem. Another one I'll briefly mention is. If, you know, I'll give you a scenario, if you're driving towards an intersection with a light and someone runs the red light, you've got the green light, and someone runs the red light, and, and there's going to be an accident, as a person, the only thing we might have time to do is just sl realize it and slam on the brakes. But for an autonomous vehicle, that one second, say, is an eternity. And it can explore 50 different courses of action and decide which of these different courses of action have different costs, and you get these incredibly complex questions about who is the car really trying to protect? Is it trying to protect, first and foremost, its occupant? Or is it trying to protect society as a whole, even if it might make a decision which is potentially suboptimal for the occupant, right? And so there's this fascinating set of questions, yes. And, um, yes. and we're not going to answer them here, and I wouldn't even, I wouldn't <laughs> even next, argue that the government the should panel. try to rule them. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but it, 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 it gets, it, it, your question kind of kicks off a fascinating discussion. So, interesting. Uh, you've hinted at the answer to this question, but I'll just ask it directly, and that is whether there is any long-term planning going on at the city or regional or state level about uh, for a world in which electric autonomous ride-sharing services <laughs> dominate the landscape and car ownership is disappearing. That seems to have enormous implications for the city and regional infrastructure but it's not clear to me that anybody's thinking about it in a coherent, long-term way. From my perspective and from, you know, I think we're in this mass stage of experimentation right now. You've got Silicon Valley bursting with startups and whether it's artificial intelligence mm -hmm. or um, LIDAR, radar, all these technologies from one end of the car to the other we are in a massive mode of experimentation. There's pilot projects going on around the world. Everybody's watching to see what's going on in Arizona, what's going on in London, what's going on in Philadelphia. So I don't see, I, there's, and there's conferences galore popping up, art, you know, autonomous vehicle conferences once a week all over Silicon Valley. So, and I'm not an expert by any means, but from my perspective, it feels like we're in this experimentation phase where it's way too early to weigh in yet, but um, there are, and there's really no clear leader yet on the technology side or what the right approach is. But I think all of this will happen, and my feeling is we're looking pretty far out, 2030 on the outside before we see this really have huge impact. So I'm more of a pessimist <laughs> on all the stuff that has to happen before we see truly uh, uh, a ubiquitous autonomous city. That's right. Now, I think we've got time for about one more question. Uh, I don't wanna... Okay. okay. Um, two, two, more, two more. If we can okay. keep it quick, that would be great. Um, my, it's a reasonably quick question, I guess. You've talked about that car ownership model going the way of the horse and buggy, and it's going to, uh, it's going to evolve into this transportation as a service. Uh, are people talking about using blockchain technology and this idea of shared distributed ledgers, cryptocurrency to pay for these, this ecosystem of services? The quick answer is yes. Um, there are a number of uh, startups and even some of the big OEMs who want to bring that into, into the, the solution. Um, and it still is, as Maureen said, just being experiments, lots of, lots of experiments going on, uh, not only technically on the cars themselves, but also how, how, how 
it's all paid for and trust and all that. And, you know, maybe you can... Anyway, it, it is happening. No, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Although uh, maybe someone will say they are, but uh, no, there's not. Okay, last question. My, my premise, and you just I'll make it explicit so you can disagree with it, is that um, congestion in San Francisco is already bad, and um, yeah, even if we get rid of air pollution, um, and that uh, it will get worse with the laissez-faire approach to regulation. So why not congestion tax? Why not do it today? Like London has a congestion tax? Yeah, London is fast to get around in by bus. Yeah, I mean, I if I can, can uh, tee you up, I was thinking that's so important now. San Francisco has the ability to lead this and not, you know, send off all the glory to Arizona where they are right now trying to take the lead in autonomous um, testing and, and leadership in the regulations of it. And it would be wonderful to see San Francisco um, as the home to so many of the startups here in the area uh, to, to show, hey, what about this way of regulating autonomous vehicles or, or such? And, um, and there, is a, there is a way. And, and consumption tax, you know, to, to, to tame the beast of the potential of having more congestion mm -hmm. right now uh, would be great to see, you know, the beginnings of discussions from governments like San Francisco. Thoughts from Maureen or Lara? Conley? Yeah, I, I think it still comes back down to the TNCs and regulating, um, you know, how many of these cars are downtown and at what times? And, you know, I heard from uh, that there's 163,000 Uber and Lyft licenses in the Bay Area. I mean, that's, um, you know, we've got to do something about, you know, controlling who's accessing, uh, you know, the city at what times of the day and whether it's a congestion tax or just licensing issue. Um, I think that's where the city and you know, the San Francisco Department of the Environment really has to lead the way. A human driver tax, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> you go, you go yeah. that one. Um, so, yeah, a, a few comments. I, I think just generally, you know, pricing things like the use of the road or the use of parking spaces. We're further with the parking spaces now. We're, we're starting to think about introducing, like, flexible pricing. Uh, on, on, on street meters, kind of the infrastructure is there, it's smart, we, can, we, we could do that already. Um, so uh, the actual use of the road space, uh, we're getting more congested, that's a, you know, they, they were uh, looking more and more like LA in some, in some aspects. Uh, it's getting, like if you look at any congestion index, it's getting right up there, uh, especially in the downtown area. We're not the regulatory authority or TNCs, I think that's important to remember. So uh, if you look at what the city like London, for instance, is doing in, in um, um, working with the TNCs to electrify them at a very rapid clip, uh, that's here, that's a statewide conversation too. So that, that, that introduces some, some challenges. Uh, but I think you're, you're right. I mean, our buses, for instance, right, if they're stuck in the same traffic as everybody else, uh, then it, it takes away some of the positive aspects of me using that, that bus, or let's say a shared vehicle or, or you know, 15 person vehicle, uh, whether that's driven by a human or uh, is fully autonomous. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, clearly if autonomous vehicles may create uh, a bigger sense of urgency than ever uh, for tackling those, uh, those issues. Well, I'd like to close by uh, thanking our, our panelists uh, for their terrific comments and also thanking all of you for spending uh, some time Thank with you. us this evening. So thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.